Okay, I guess we are about to start. So dear participant, good afternoon, good morning, depends on the country and place where you <laughs> stay right now. Uh, for us in Ankara, it's four o'clock. For Professor Plohi, it's early morning, but I hope it's not a, a problem for everyone. And um, we are about to start our uh, Eurasia Talks seminars, um, series of seminars. And um, uh, just I will tell you the program there. Uh, first, I will give a floor to our co-host of this event. And uh, after this, I will present today's honorable speaker. And then we will have question and answers uh, section. So before I start, uh, before we start, I kindly ask uh, all the participants to mute their um Yeah, to deliver um, a welcome speech, um, I invite the head of Eurasia Studies Program at the Middle East Technical University, Associate Professor Ishik Kuchu Bonaparte. Ishik Kuchu, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. I'm not going to keep it long. I know that it's early morning in Boston, so Professor Ploy probably <laughs> um, needs to start um, as soon as uh, possible. Uh, I'm just glad that uh, we're able to organize this um, Eurasia Talk series uh, with my colleague, uh, Dr. Bilyatska, together with uh, Metu and Karabük University together. Um, as uh, this is a region that we all, um, you know, um, uh, spend years in focusing and studying, researching. Um, this is a region which we love the, the, the states and societies and um, history, culture. Um, therefore, Eurasia, in the wider sense, uh, we decided that these days which uh, we can't physically come together at least at the vir virtual um, platforms we can discuss issues related to the region then um, you know to exchange ideas and I think um, the region in this sense is you know the wider region and uh, we can the, the name of the seminar series is Eurasia Talks as um, we didn't want this to be some, not boring, but you know, very formal thing. So we're gonna be talking about issues that is a concern to the people, societies um, and states of the region. And I think this is a very a great um, opportunity for us to start with Professor Plohi of Harvard University, head of the Harvard uh, Ukrainian Research Institute and a very prolific, prominent um, scholar of um, history. And um, I think, I mean, when I look at his um, CV, basically it's a very, um, is a very pro prolific author. He has many, uh, book length um, books he has oh, and um, the latest one is the uh, the one um, which came out in 2015 and which was translated into Turkish um, two years later and I guess very popular in Turkey okay without further ado I think I'm going to let Yulia talk a little bit uh, about Professor Plohe and then maybe we can move on thanks for coming hope we'll enjoy uh, this series Thanks. Um, thank you, Ashik Hojam. So yeah, uh, as you already mentioned, our today's speaker is uh, Professor Sergei Plohi, who is one of the world's uh, preeminent historians who is focusing on history of Ukraine. And he is a Mikhail Gorshevsky a Professor of Ukrainian History at Harvard University, uh, where he's also served as a director of Harvard Ukrainian Research Institute. And his research interests include the intellectual, cultural, and international history of Eastern Europe uh, with the emphasis of, uh, on Ukraine. And Professor Plohi also is an author um, of several books, including um, The Last Empire, The Final Days of Soviet Union, The Kodak Myth, uh, History of a Nationhood in the Age of Empires, 
Chernobyl, the history of uh, nuclear catastrophe, and um, many others. And uh, the, uh, this book, The um, Gates of Europe, A History of Ukraine, that was published originally in 2015, uh, was actually translated and published in Turkey, in Turkish language, and it calls as Avrupanen Kapilare Ukraina Tarihi. Uh, and uh, as far as uh, I uh, can see, it uh, has become one of the fundamental sources uh, on Ukrainian history for Turkish uh, readers. And um, with a growing interest towards uh, Ukraine and Turkish soldiers and uh, young researchers, we are invited, Professor Profi, to send uh, to shed a light on the challenges of reconceptualization, uh, the history of Ukraine after its independence. And uh, before I give a floor to our speaker, I would like to remind again that you can write your questions in the chat section and I will collect them and summarize and uh, pass to Professor Plahi during our Q&A session. And also uh, after the presentation, you can uh, ask uh, the question in person when the presentation is finished. Uh, so right now, uh, Professor Plohi, the floor is yours, uh, please. Uh, uh, excellent, uh, Yulia, thank you very much for this introduction. And in general, thank you for the, um, all the parties involved, the uh, Parabook University and any other entities that uh, put their efforts together to organize this event. It's a great, it's a great pleasure. This is the first time that I am speaking, um, not to the international audience, but to the international audience at the center of which are uh, scholars and students uh, from Turkey. So it's a special pleasure. I'm, uh, I'm uh, very pleased and honored that the book was translated in Turkish and it looks like it, it has its readership there. And it is, uh, my talk will be really organized around this, this book, The Gates of Europe, and I will try to put it into the context of the previous historiography of Ukraine and try to explain what I was going to do in that book. Whether it's, I succeeded or not, that's, that's for a um, reader to judge. And after that, uh, as was already announced, we'll have a, a Q&A, uh, so we have a discussion. So I certainly look forward to your questions because it's in my uh, personal experience, it's much more productive to um, discuss the questions that um, you really want to discuss as opposed to me making guesses about what questions might be of interest to you and then talking about that. So again, I think that the discussion can be one of the most productive parts of, of our meeting today. So let me, let me start with some basics uh, and then we'll get to historiography and then eventually we'll get to that book. So one of the basics is that Ukraine is a um, country that appeared on the map of the world in the 20th century as a modern nation. And in that sense, it's the uh, nation like the majority in today's world that came out of the process of the disintegration of the empires in the, uh, in the um, 20th century. The peculiarity of Ukraine, uh, again, it's not absolutely unique in that sense, but it is peculiar in a sense that today's territory of Ukraine is formed out of the former possessions of at least three, maybe four different empires, depending on the time, and the, certainly the Ottoman Empire is, is one of them. Uh, nations like that back in the 19th century when they were exception rather than the rule were called non-historical nations. And what that meant was that they didn't have a history of the statehood or at least that history of the statehood didn't, didn't, was, uh, wasn't uninterrupted. Again, that, that definition belongs to the 19th century because the, most of the nations that appeared in the 20th are non-historical. So what do you do with a history of non-historical nation? Whether non-historical nations have history? And Ukraine's case uh, demonstrates that, uh, yeah, maybe uh, some of those nations have more history than they can handle successfully and, and for, the, for the benefit of the group. There is more than one history in the, in the package called history of Ukraine. 
the territory of Ukraine, like, like the territory of today's Turkey, got lucky in a sense that uh, we got into the um, stories and then into books of Herodotus, so the first recognized historian in the world. So the area of the Black Sea in particular, the Mediterranean, of course, are, are covered there. The indigenous history writing starts in Kiev, starts in the 11th century, and uh, the main task of the uh, chronicle writers in Kiev at that time is to integrate their local lore, their local histories, their local traditions into the template of world history that comes from Byzantium. And that template is, is Christian, that template is about the creation of nations, and the, the chronicles from Kiev try to find a place in this Christian narrative of the world and, and stick in their own legends about Kay and, 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 and his brothers and his sister and, and somehow integrate the local history, the history of the Rus into the world Christian history. The model comes from Byzantium. Um, now, um, <clears throat> uh, the, the uh, focus of, of that history writing in Kiev in the medieval period is the land of Rus. And the land of Rus is really a conglomerate, a state that is being created by being created with the help of the Vikings. The, the, the term Rus would be related really to the ruling group, ruling family. And then whatever is conquered by that, by that group would be called Rus. And historians talk about two models of Rus. One is a larger Rus, and another is Rus land, and another is a smaller or central Rus land. And smaller or central Rus land is really focused on today's Ukraine. It's Kiev, Chernihiv, and Periyaslav, so the, the area around today's capital of Kiev. So what that means, if the chronicler sits in Kiev, Kiev gets actually much more airtime, much more attention than any, any other group. And again, that means that uh, the population of, or, or the predecessors of the population of today's Ukraine got more lucky than maybe other groups that were further away from the center of the chronicle right, further away from, from, from uh, Kiev. Now, the chronicles is really a product of uh, first, the, 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 the golden era is the medieval period. But in Ukraine, the chroniclers as the mode of how you write history continues all the way into the 17th and 18th century. But the elites, who commission those works of history and people who write them are not anymore monks or, or priests, how it was during the me medieval period of time. In the 17th and 18th century, they're the Cossacks. So the, the, the Cossack intellectuals, the Cossack scribes. So this is the Cossacks as a phenomenon is a new group that emerges in the 16th and 17th century. And that's about the so-called settler colonization of the of the steppe areas. That's where the settled population moves into the steppe, pushes out of the Nogais or Crimean Tatars and try to claim, claim land for, for the agricultural production. And that, that uh, movement creates, creates new societies, including Cossack society, and they are the history writers. Again, what they write about? They write about the, their land, which would be again in the Dnieper area, in the Dnieper region. So we get, a, again, a lot, a lot of this focus on that particular part of the uh, country where first the Kiev uh, Rus was centered, where the, 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 the origins of the chronicle writers appeared. So from the very beginning, you see that there is disparity in the way how different regions of Ukraine are presented or reflected or memorized in, in the chronicle writing. It changes, it changes really in the 19th century with the rise of the um, professional historiography. So where the concept is, now we are not writing anymore the history of the dynasty and the regions that they conquered. No, we don't write anymore the history of the social strata, which would be the Cossacks. We are writing a history of a nation. A nation is defined in German terms by language. So the... the mm, mm, Anthropologists, what today would be called anthropologists, the, the, the uh, folklorists go there, collect lore, 
try to figure out what the language it is, and then that would be the history of Ukraine. And that's that's the concept of the 19th century. So all regions have to be have to be included. And Ukrainian uh, professional historiography emerges at the same time when the Ukrainian modern uh, political project emerges. So the, the name of the, of the person at the center of both processes is Mykola Kostomarov, who was the author uh, in the 1840s of the first political manifesto of, of uh, modern Ukraine. And he was also a professional historian, a professor of history at, at uh, Kiev University and then at St. Petersburg University, a major contributing force to the Russian imperial historiography and the founder of the uh, academic, academic Ukrainian history. So we are talking about really mid 19th century. But what Kostomaro was doing, Kostomaro was ri writing books on specific topics. His most famous book is on Bohdan Khmelnytsky he doesn't write the history of Ukraine as a whole. And that waited until really late 19th and the beginning of the 20th century. And it was produced by a number of people. And it's very interesting that Ukrainian history in the Russian empire or in the Austria-Hungarian empire at that time is a very marginalized field. What does it mean when it is marginalized field in the 19th and the beginning of the 20th century? That means that the groups that, or, or the people, the kind of people that otherwise would actually have no access to that, to that field, have access and make a major impact on that. And when I talk about those groups, I mean women. So the first, the first history, the, the complex history of Ukraine was uh, written by uh, the woman the, uh, who didn't have a uh, university position at that time. And uh, again, if you look at the Ukrainian literature, the prominence of women there is actually, it's two or three times as important as in Russian or in other in established already traditions, because this is a new field. And in your field, the, 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 the women at the beginning of the 19th, uh, end of the 19th, the beginning of the 20th century, they go there. So Alexandra Efemenko is the author of the first, even before Mikhail Hrushevsky, the, the real founder of Ukrainian modern national historiography. A few years before that, it was Alexandra Efemenko, a woman who won a competition for the right to, to write that history and then produced history of Ukraine. So what was Efemenko's history and then history of, by, written by Hrushevsky? It was a history of a nation which happened to be a pretty much peasant nation it was also a history with special emphasis on people, populism. Populism was modern, and that the, the, the Mikhail Hrushevsky, the beginning of the 19th century, this is the founding stone of contemporary Ukrainian historiography. What is built on that, including my own writings and writings of my colleagues today, is the Hrushevsky is the foundation. But you write, you write that history also to a degree against Hrushevsky in a sense of, okay, that's, that's the standard, but then new, new trends appear, new approaches come, new questions emerge. And you, 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 really, you really look at that, at that classic, but then you move your own way. And the first who started that tradition, rebellion against Hrushevsky narrative, which was populist narrative, were his students at the University, University of Lviv, who said after the revolution, after the loss of the Ukrainian struggle to acquire its independent state, they said, okay, there is something really terribly wrong with our populism. Let's bring our elites back to, 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 to our history. Let's talk about state. Yes, it's true that we didn't have state for long periods of times, but that's what we need now. Let's go back and let's examine what is there. What is, what is the state that the Cossacks create? Let's look at the Kiev and Rus and the state that was created in Kiev in medi medieval ages. So that's a trend that really becomes dominant in the 20s and 30, uh, 30s. It, it, it is based on Hrushevsky, but it takes a different, a different approach of what it should be. Uh, there is emergence of autonomous entity after the revolution of 1917 within the Soviet Union, which is called Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic which acquires its own historiography where the class struggle is like in Marxist uh, classic 
narrative of, of the Soviet period, the class struggle is at the center of, of, of the narrative. So any revolt, any uprising is valued, put at the center of the narrative, revolution is absolutely central, and that's, that's, a, different, that's a different take on, on Ukrainian history. And what you see uh, after the Second World War is really that there are two of these narratives that are trying to, 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 to fight each other. One would be a statist Ukrainian narrative, and another would be a class-based Ukrainian narrative. And that brings us to the, to the fall of the Soviet Union. That brings us to, the, to 1991. And a very interesting phenomenon emerges at that time is that a book written by an uh, author, uh, again, it uh, was written in English, Boris Subtelny, who was a um, um, graduate at Harvard University and then professor at the, uh, one of the universities in Canada, in Toronto, he publishes a book on Ukrainian history. And that book uh, was translated into Ukrainian and became the most popular book on Ukrainian history in Ukraine in the 1990s. So what, what Subtelny had to offer? Subtelny uh, said that, well, the, the most interesting, the most defining part of Ukrainian historiography is modernization, modernization of the 19th and 20th century. So that's, that's the paradigm that put at the center of it. And then uh, um, Subtelny's um, um, history is, is very often uh, labeled partially justifiably, but not always, as the history of Ukrainians alone. So it's a, it's a history of Ukrainian nation, meaning the traditional understanding of a nation, not a political nation, but a nation based on language, on, 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 on culture. Again, it's, it's oversimplification. There is much more in Subtelny. There is, it's much more interesting text. But again, in, in terms of the maybe main point that's the, 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 that captures and that will help us to understand where, where we are right now. Now, uh, in a few short years, maybe within 10 years, uh, Subtenny's colleague at the University of Toronto, uh, uh, Paul Robert Magucci, publishes his own huge volume, which is actually even thicker than the volume of Subtenny. And his approach is different. He says, well, wait a minute, Ukraine, came out of the, different, of the different empires, but it also encompasses a lot of uh, groups that, which are not Ukrainian, especially when it comes to the history. The city would be dominated by non-Ukrainians. There, there would be Poles and Jews and Russians. The working class, the way how it was formed in Ukraine, in Eastern Ukraine in the 19th century was basically ethnically mostly Russian uh, partially Jewish, so people like or families of uh, Khrushchev or Brezhnev, they come from Russia to Ukraine. They're part of this uh, uh, working class that is being formed. So uh, Maguch's approach is different. Maguch's approach is let's write history of Ukraine as a multi-ethnic entity. Let's pay equal attention to the Crimean Tatars Let's pay equal uh, attention to the to the Jews, to the Poles, to other groups. That uh, yeah, thank you, thank you. Yulia. This is the, 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 this is Bob Magwitch's book, uh, and again, it's also oversimplification. There is more in Magwitch than multi-ethnic approach, but the Subtenly and Magwitch emerges this to to Poles to a degree of how you look at at history of Ukraine. Now, I am sitting now at Harvard and I'm talking about uh, texts and books produced by either Harvard graduates, both Magwitch and Subtelny were uh, graduate students at Harvard or, or somehow related to, to, to United States. And I'm not talking about Ukraine and what is done in Ukraine in 19, uh, since 1991 which one way to look at that would be, okay, say that I'm biased or I don't know what is happening there. But there is also possible another explanation. And that explanation, or at least from my perspective, is that we don't really have, as a tradition in Ukraine today, a book, a general survey of Ukrainian history written by one author, the author that would have certain academic credentials and recognition. 
Because like in many other countries in Ukraine today, the academic field and the popular writing on history are separated. The academic institutions create a very interesting work, the multi-volume history of Ukraine, the work of five, six, 10, 15, 20 people. When you look at the surveys of Ukrainian history, they're produced as a rule by people who don't have that kind of academic credentials, but they're excellent teachers, maybe um, teachers in the, in the, in the, on the university level or maybe uh, on the, on the uh, summer school, on, on the school, on the level of the secondary school. So that is that is my excuse why I'm not bringing into this into this uh, discussion what happened in Ukraine in the last 20 to 30 years. Not because uh, uh, nothing was done. A lot of it actually the, the center of Ukrainian studies, of course, is in Ukraine. The most interesting work is produced there. But it's not when it comes to service. So that's where I understand also my book comes in. Again, uh, we come uh, here in, in the United States with a um, situation in which we offer these general courses on Ukrainian history from Kiev and Rus up until Maidan and developments today, something that really done in Ukraine because there the Ukrainian history is chopped into the, into the sections, into the periods, into the 19th century, into the 20th century. And uh, <clears throat> uh, the, 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 this, um, the, the survey is written by one person is really not not yet not yet very popular in Ukraine. That is also for me to explain to myself why why my book now goes through the fourth edition in Ukraine. Something that I never ex expected to, to to happen. I believe that Ukraine had enough of its of its own um, authors and texts. But again, the possible explanation is just the, the way how differently the academic field is structured in Ukraine versus, let's say, the, the, the United States of America or Canada. Now, uh, that brings me to the, to, after a long introduction to, to my book and what, what uh, I was trying to do there. Well, one thing that I tried to answer to myself is whether, whether it's a good idea to write a history of Ukraine as a state and, and nation as a country in the era when in historiography, there is a revolt against national history as such. National history is being put under, under, under the huge question mark. It's a constructed history. It's basically, it, it, it misses a lot of important, uh, important parts of history otherwise. So that was something that was done in the 19th century. What do you do in the 20th century when the entire field rebelled against national history and you're writing national history? Well, my approach to that is that, uh, well, maybe the historiography develops in that way, that the, the, the national history is per se, but that's not the way how the world is developing. The world actually developing into the creation of this, of this nation states or creation of a political nation and that is the, the kind of a history that is in demand in the world in general or in any particular country. So the question for, for me as a, as a historian, as a writer was, how do you reconcile maybe an old form of national history with the new developments in the field? And uh, uh, for me, I, at least in my mind, I was writing a new national history. A history of, of a nation which would look at the nation as a political nation, but also which would include, include the, the achievements of historiography of the last, uh, let's say, 50 years. And um, what, uh, what, I, what I mean by that are the, the turn, for example, to the, uh, to the um, uh, spatial history. The, 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 the introduction of the, of the spatial categories, the cultural turn in uh, history in general, the um, uh, interest in, in identities, which is close to cultures. And all of this, all of this uh, parts of, of rel relatively recent developments in history, I was trying to integrate into my work. More than that, I put one of those components, and in particular, this uh, interest in culture, 
which is really a, a, a development of, of the last 20, 30 years at the center of my narrative. You remember I was talking to you about the, the um, desire of the Cavan chronicler writers to integrate their history into the Christian narrative about uh, the, 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 the desire of uh, Hrushevsky and people around him to write history of people, uh, Subtelny nation and, and uh, the, the Marxist historians class. I put culture into, into the center of what I'm trying to talk about. And culture goes beyond the, the, the understanding of language or folklore tradition or anything of that, of that nature. It's a much broader category. And I structure my, my <clears throat> history as a um, really product of the two moving frontiers. So for those of you who uh, already had a chance maybe to look at the book, I apologize that I'm, I'm repeating that. But again, this is a talk about the book, so I can't talk completely all the time about something else. So I have to turn to it. And again, the, the key, the, the key, the key, um, or, or organizing factor in that book is the movement of two frontiers, which are cultural frontiers in, uh, in uh, their nature. So the one of those frontiers is the, the frontier between the settled areas, the, the forest areas, the settled population, and another is the steppe frontier. The, 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 and another, another side of that frontier is the steppe, which is populated by uh, people of different culture, that it's nomadic groups. They also come with, with different religions. They, they also come with different beliefs. But it's as the frontier moves, the, the settled population not only pushes the Nogais or Crimean Tatars out of that area, it also had, uh, accepts and, and integrates the cultural modes, the way of dealing with the, with the uh, environment, with, with the landscape, in, inherits the, 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 the organization of the city of settlements because they are the same. So what you see is not just one group is pushing other out of that territory, but what you see is that the frontier as it moves produce a new, uh, a new reality, a new cultural reality, it produces a new quality. Another frontier that is, that is uh, uh, moving, it's an east-west frontier. The, the first one was north-south. Another is east-west frontier. And that's a division that goes back to the division of um, uh, Roman Empire. This is a division between uh, uh, Eastern Christianity and Western Christianity, which again, serve as, a, as, as a maybe a marker were much bigger cultural differences, which come with a different understanding of the role of authority in the society, with the autonomy of the church, with different form of organization of the, of the societal and political and cultural life. And that is, that is the, the frontier between Eastern and Western Christianity. So these are, this are the two frontiers that for me decide what, what what uh, Ukraine, what Ukraine becomes. And um, it's again a reflection in many ways, also relatively recent trends in, in the historiography. And this is interest in the uh, borderland, in the periphery, in the frontier. The trend in current historiography that says, okay, really to understand the center, to understand Istanbul or to understand Rome or to understand Moscow, you really have to see how they manifest themselves in the borderland, because that's where they define themselves vis-a-vis -vis the other. And uh, for me, the, the most important, important part of that new trend was, and I, I tried to apply it, was that uh, it allows for the, for the uh, um, subjectivity, or it, it allows for, for uh, the role of actor for the person who is at, the, at that frontier. Because the frontier itself creates a different cu cultural reality, social reality, political reality. It's always much freer that, than the areas that are uh, um, located closer to the, to, to the center. Uh, to, to when I uh, talk about, about that particular concept in the United States, I uh, always ask people to think about the 
American Westerns, the, the Hollywood production. And imagine, ima that, that, that is the frontier. And again, there is authority, there is power, but it's, 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 a, different, it's, it's a different category and it creates a new, a new and different society. So um, that was, uh, that was the, 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 founding, the, the, the founding kind of a, a, a basis for my attempt to understand, understand Ukrainian history. It came with, with uh, of course, some um, losses. Uh, not everything falls into that, into that category. Again, I tried, especially when it comes to the 19th and 20th century, I tried to fill that with, with using other approaches and other paradigms. But the plus for me was that it allowed me to really look at the Ukrainian history over the long period of time not just start, starting with the Kiev and Rus and going up to Maidan and to the current, current uh, conflict in, and, and war in, uh, and annexation of the Crimea, because again, it all somehow miraculously fits that, that, that general paradigm. But um, it also um, <clears throat> allowed me to, to um, restructure maybe the, the accepted chronology of uh, Ukrainian history, to think about it a little bit, a little bit differently. And uh, uh, that, is, that is maybe where I will uh, focus for another, uh, for another uh, few minutes. Uh, Uh, one thing that again chronologically, uh, chronologically the, the, the book uh, departs from uh, from traditional uh, Ukrainian historiography is in the way that it's um, it it looks at the twentieth um, century in particular. So the the, the dominant the dominant uh, point in in the history uh, traditionally, especially in the Marxist history of the region, but not only. Uh, is the revolution of 1917. And even the, the, the way how the courses have been divided, they are divided, okay, the history pre-Soviet, before 1917, and then 1917. So the positions are divided, or at least till recently, were defined in those ways. And I, uh, uh, I engage in this uh, uh, act of sacrilege to a degree. I say, okay, not that 1917 is not important, but it actually abstracts our view on other, other issues and other, other processes. And uh, 1917 is a continuation of World War I, and World War I came relatively recently back to the attention. So I tried to bring World War I back into the, into the picture. And I also, one of, the, one of my uh, blocks in the book is the, the uh, um, history of the wars, 20th century wars. From World War I to World War II, again, I'm not necessarily very original in that approach. The approach exists there, but at least when you bring it to the general survey, that's maybe is done for the first time, where I look at World War I, World War II, and violence created by them. And it is in that context that I put both the revolution, the, the, the famine, the, 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 the class struggle and, and social destruction of, of the peasantry and, and other things, but they're framed by the revolutions. <clears throat> Now, um, I told you that the, the, the cultural, the cultural uh, paradigm is helpful, but it also leaves certain lacunas in, in, in the way how you look at the history of the region. And those lacunas become especially um, clear and, 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 and obvious when you move into the 19th and 20th century. And there I allowed for, the, for uh, a number of different categories to enter the picture and move quite close to the center of that picture. And those categories are the categories of nation and empire. And I write in my book that nation is, is an important category of analysis in the book, but it's not the absolutely central one. I don't believe that nations appear only in the 19th century. Uh, the recent historiography talks at length about early modern nations. Again, they have different characteristics. They're a little bit different animals, but again, nations is not the in invention of the 19th century. They existed before. But the role that national identity plays in the early modern or modern 
in the in the history of of uh, the, the country, the region, the humankind in general, it differ it differs depending on the period. And 19th and 20th century, that's really where this new form of national identity becomes extremely important. And the biggest question for me is how to square that with the empire. Uh, uh, because again, national histories of Ukraine were written before that. And I'm allegedly trying to write a new national history. So it becomes new, not only because of the cultural approach, but it becomes new because of the way how I'm trying to deal with empire. And I'm not rejecting it. I'm, 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 I consider it a complete, uh, absolutely legitimate, legitimate pro uh, product of the historical development. And uh, for me, it's interesting to see uh, the way in which non-state groups, elites and formations work within the empire, find, the, find their voice there uh, and, and, and promote their interests. And that approach is interesting, not only when I look, for example, at the uh, Cossack elite, which under Catherine II, at the time of the uh, first annexation of the Crimea gets to the top of the St. Petersburg uh, um, apparatus with uh, Chancellor Bezborochko and others. But I uh, take the same approach to the Soviet period, because otherwise, how would you explain the 18 year long period of rule of Leonid Brezhnev was a product of the Ukrainian party machine. Well, uh, the the uh, prominence of the Ukrainian figures in Moscow under Khrushchev. So uh, that, that uh, more maybe nuanced approach to, to empire and multi-ethnic state and their relation to the classical na national narrative was another, was another um, element of the history that I was I was uh, thinking uh, thinking about. Now, uh, where does that leave me in terms of the previous previous writings and previous historiography? Well, one thing is that I kind of try to to take as much as possible from from the previous debates, including this national versus multi ethnic history of Subtelny and Magochi. But I believe that the, the, that particular debate, that particular discussion already exhausted itself in terms of the production of the new, new knowledge and new understanding. So I'm not ignoring it, but I'm moving beyond that, taking, taking advantage of, of the, of the mm. uh, new, new approaches, new discoveries that came with that. Now, I see that I'm approaching probably the, the, the uh, last few minutes of the time allocated to me. And I said that the most import, important and probably interesting part will be about uh, uh, questions and, and, and discussion. So what I want to, to add at the end is that the most challenging period for me to write was the, the period of contemporary Ukraine and contemporary developments. Historians, generally, we are trained to, to, we are more comfortable with people who are dead than with people who are alive. We, we, we study past, we are masters there, we can, we can say whatever we want. It's much more difficult to write about people who are among us. It's much more difficult, at least from my perspective, again, the political scientists and sociologists and anthropologists do that without any, any problem whatsoever. But for me, trained as a historian, it was really a real, real challenge. What do you write about the, the current war? What do you write when you know that people whom you, whom you met, who you know actually suffered or, or lost their lives? It's, it's, it's a difficult challenge. And uh, what, you, what you write when you have a particular political sympathies and antipathies, how much of yourself you allow into that text, which covers the history of the period of more than 1,000 years, which brings another question. OK, for you, it seems to me so important, so crucial, what happened in 2013 at Maidan in Ukraine or in 2014 and 2015 on the battlegrounds of, of, of um, Donbass. But if you put that into the context of the southern year history, how much time you allocate to that? And uh, uh, Mike uh, then 
um, approach to that was that, yes, absolutely, you, you allocate more time and, and more attention than probably it would, uh, would uh, get otherwise. But then you write to the people who are, you write for the readers. You're not writing for the history textbooks. You're not writing for the, for, for, for the people who are not uh, here anymore. You write for your contemporaries. And that's, that's the social function of history and surveys like, like uh, the one that we are talking about. So I, I certainly uh, uh, allowed, allowed my own approaches and my own sympathies in my own voice to a degree in that last chapter of, uh, of the book. And I just completed and submitted to the, uh, to the publisher a new chapter, which is called New Dawn, because again, Ukraine found itself uh, unwillingly in the center of the American political process and the process of impeachment. And probably with Biden now becoming the president, we'll hear about Ukraine more. So uh, I, 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 uh, the, the publisher wanted me to talk about that and to talk about the last five years. So again, I, I did as I was asked, but again, I, I faced the same kind of challenges that I just described to you. So, um, uh, I will I will stop here. I uh, want to 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 say that again when uh, when um, the events in Ukraine in 2013 2014 started, I didn't have uh, plans to write a survey of Ukrainian history. Um, it 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 is based on the lectures that I am given at, at at Harvard, and I was thinking, okay, if I publish that, then I would have to write new lectures. Why do I need that? But then the events of 2014 and 2015 came along. And uh, for me, it was very clear that there was so much first interest in Ukraine, but then actually lack of understanding of what is happening in Ukraine. So I, I was trying to somehow fill that gap that I thought existed there. And uh, the, the book, that's, that's what came out of that, of, of that feeling and uh, out of that effort. So again, thank you, thank you for, for your attention. I know it, it's a hard thing to do, to listen to a talking head without any PowerPoint, without any images, but I was thinking about PowerPoint and then I realized, okay, I'm going to cover so much that, that uh, probably, probably uh, and, and there, there is so little time that uh, the, the, the PowerPoint can be counterproductive. So thanks again. Thank you very much, Professor. It was a great presentation. And uh, sometimes I actually think that without PowerPoint, uh, people yeah. pay more attention to what is exactly a speaker is saying. So I think it's a, an advantage. Um, probably we, we, not probably, but for sure, we will start our Q&A session. And uh, as a moderator, uh, may I start with a question <laughs> for the, <laughs> as a as a person, um, because I mean, I know that most of uh, the listeners, uh, Turkish students and researchers and academics. So my questions actually will be focused on the, um, let's say, Turkish, the, the place of Ukraine in the Turkish historiography. So first of all, um, we have to say that in Turkish um, tradition of history writing, this term of Kievan Rus is actually says as Kiev Rus. And um, this Rus in Turkish means an adjective and a noun for a Russian. So actually, uh, when we translate it, says it like Kievan Russian, yeah, something, not Rus exactly. And um, when my students or some other young researchers who just started to deal with Ukrainian history, they see this uh, term, so they automatically think, okay, it's some place that was uh, belonged to Russia and now by somehow it became um, Ukrainian, yeah? Uh, and they, they confused about this. I know that most of uh, probably my Ukrainian colleagues who are here uh, today, they know the, uh, the answer of this uh, question and they know how to deal with it. But what, do you, what would you say for um, Turkish readers and listeners who may be just like the first time uh, hear this term and cannot distinguish what is like Rus exactly? Uh, well, uh, thanks. Uh, thanks for this question. And uh, the the general the general tendency of uh, thinking about uh, uh, Kievan Rus as Russia is is not limited to Turkey. It's it's, it's much more global. So the 
uh, key texts on, on the um, East European history in the United States were about Kiev and Russia. Uh, but it changed in the last in the last maybe 20 to 30 years, partially because the institute that I am um, uh, I, I am the director now, and my predecessors, including Omilan Pritsak, who was a renowned scholar of Turkic languages, very interested in Turkey. So they, they really turned uh, Ukrainian Institute and Harvard into the center of the study of Kiev and Rus. And they became the, 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 the people who decided what, what, uh, what is the proper name in the um, academic historiography and then in the public discourse. Now, the term Rus didn't exist in, in uh, certainly in English, so it was integrated and now it is fully accepted. And I think that that's, that's the way probably, at least one of the possible ways to deal with that issue in uh, other languages and another culture, just uh, um, bring in terms if they, don't, if they don't exist. I can tell you, I can tell you that in Russian language, they have a, a problem with the definition of the population of the, let's say, the, the Grand Duchy of Lithuania, the Ukrainian and Belarusians, which in Ukrainian, there is a term for that, Ruski, which is different from Rosiski, but there is no such term in, in, in uh, Russian. And even our colleagues who really re recognize that those were not Russians and, and try to do something, they're really confined by, by the language and the conventions of the language. So there are different attempts to bring in the, the, the soft sign Ruski or have one S in, instead of two. So it is, it is an issue, it is a problem. It exists in a number of languages. And at the end of the day, we, the way how we deal with that, we, we either import terms or create new terms. After all, we all know that Byzantium under such name didn't exist, right? But the, 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 there is a field of Byzantine studies. Thank you. And my second question will be very connected to the to the last your words about the translation. Uh, again, when um, now young researchers started to uh, create their um, research on Ukraine uh, in Turkish language, let's say they uh, face very huge problem of how to translate these names um, into um, how to translate names. Yulia, your microphone is closed, I guess. It's off. Okay, <laughs> I'm very sorry. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so my question was about the translation of uh, some terms and names uh, that belong to U Ukraine, to Ukrainian history into Turkish. Because by somehow your book became a kind of um, a reference to um, to young researcher how to name certain period of time or how to name certain uh, so uh, how exactly I mean I know that it was translated by professional translators but um, did they decide uh, how to call this uh, the, the term that doesn't exist or didn't exist how was the translation uh, of this book done and who decide um, what term will be used in this translation. Well, uh, thank you. Uh, excellent question. Uh, mm, th there was no consultation with me on the on the terminology, which uh, I think is a good thing because I don't I, I don't really uh, speak or read uh, in Turkish or any Turkic languages. So uh, uh, keeping me out of that process, I think, was a wise wise decision. But in general, I can tell you that uh, the, the terms that I use in English also didn't exist in English, right? So how do you translate in English Starshina or Hurunji or all these other titles? So for a, for a number of years, there existed a um, group of people uh, specifically dealing with early modern Ukrainian history. They were at Harvard and then at the Canadian Institute of Ukrainian Studies where they were translating uh, Hrushevsky, History of Ukraine Rus, into English. And uh, at the end of every volume of Hrushevsky, there is a long list of terms of how they rendered in, into English. 
So what we do with here is that there is an Ukrainian term that is being translated into English decided by a group of scholars, academics. And then you have a um, translator in, uh, in, 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 in Turkey or, or in China or somewhere else, and they are struggling with the same issues on their own. So it's, it's, a, very difficult, it's a very difficult task to deal with. And again, I, I wish I could help, I, I couldn't. I look at the, at the texts, again, if, if the publishers ask me to do that in the languages that I can at least half understand. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, Turkish is not one of those. Uh, thank you very much. Probably we will start some kind of, I don't know, uh, workshop yeah. on how to translate some uh, words in Turkish. We had this idea with our students. So like everyone, if you want to contribute to the proper translation of Ukrainian historical terms into Turkish, uh, feel free to contact me by email or other ways of communications. Uh, we'll be in touch. Uh, so a small, small advertisement. Okay. <laughs> and if I can, if I can add to that, uh, certainly in in in, <clears throat> in Turkish you face much fewer problems than in English because quite a few of Ukrainian terms were borrowings from Turkish. So. Yeah, exactly. It wasn't the case with English. Yes. Uh, and we have a question from Yusuf Khayr-Sever, um, actually about uh, cultures. Which country's culture from neighboring uh, countries such as Poland, Russia, Romania, Belarus uh, has affected Ukraine most for your opinion? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, thank you um, for this question. Uh, I want actually to, to use the, this question also to say something related that I intended to say at the, at the um, uh, in, in the main body of my presentation and somehow it skipped my mind. Uh, the the uh, uh, title of my book is the Gates of Europe, and as I explained as I explained earlier, it is about the cultural frontiers that they move. But it's the, the vision is skewed by the term that Europe is there, right? So the the frontier Europe is just one on on the one side of frontier. There is other side, which is the, 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 the step, which is also the, the broader Ottoman world, uh, which didn't get as much, again, it's acknowledged by this approach, by this frame, but didn't get as much attention. And there is one reason for that, uh, uh, again, th there are maybe many, but one of the reasons for that is that we really in Ukraine are uh, very, very early on in developing our own studies and our own expertise in the, in the uh, Ottoman history, in the, in the, in the uh, Turkic uh, world, uh, languages and so on and so forth. It's, my, my predecessor here, Omilan Pritsak, was a big promoter of that, created the Institute of Eastern Studies in Kyiv, or recreated after 1991, but we really, really only start in that. And that's, that's the, where there is a huge field for development Again, a, a colleague of mine, Viktor Ostapchuk at the University of Toronto, I know that uh, generations now of graduate students from Turkey are trained by him because he is, a, he is a historian of the Ottoman history. He tries to do that. But again, that's, that's, that's the, the uh, in Ukrainian, they say, ne ora ne pole. So it's basically, there is such, 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 such a future for careers, such a future for research. Now, in terms of what, <clears throat> what uh, cultures influence the most, uh, what I said before will uh, tell you that also, given, given the lack of our knowledge of the, of the, um, of the East, uh, I probably would talk mostly about the West and that would be Poland. So the, the, the country that um, Ukraine was, was part of it uh, for centuries and centuries even after the partitions of Poland, after the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth disintegrated, uh, the, the, uh, there were cultural wars all the way up until the end of the 19th century between Russian and Polish culture for the, for the ownership of, of, Ukrainian, of, of Ukrainian language and Ukrainian culture and, and, and Ukrainian, uh, Ukrainian social terms. So it's, it's enormous influence. 
another another influence uh, came of course from uh, from uh, Russia and when I say Russia I mean first of all the imperial capitals so the empires create high cultures empires create rich cultures because of the just ability of accumulation of the resources and those and those uh, those uh, cultures uh, certainly have impact on on on, on the periphery, on other groups, on the frontier in particular. And last but not least, it's the, the, the uh, culture of the Mediterranean and the Ottoman world. And I told you that we don't know much about that, but uh, I invite you to, <clears throat> to, to, to stress the importance of, the, of those influences that we don't start, didn't really start in earnest to research look at the uh, portrayal of Kozak Mamai, the most popular, the most popular maybe uh, figure in, in, the, in the peasant and the Kozak households in the 19th, the beginning of the 20th century, the symbol of the Kozakdom and early modern Ukraine. Well, this is, uh, I, I, I wonder whether you, you can recognize the pose of Buddha or not. Again, he certainly doesn't look particularly like the, 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 the clothes that he wears don't come necessarily from Paris. It's more likely they come maybe from Istanbul or somewhere else. Look, look at the portrayal of the Cossacks who are writing a letter to the Turkish Sultan Bayrepin, the most expensive uh, painting that was ever produced and sold in the Russian Empire, and look how the Cossacks are dressed there. So this is a teaser. This is an invitation for all of us to look much deeper into that and to understand what those impacts were. So uh, I, I avoided from this discussion, uh, let's say, uh, Belarus or, or Romania. And this is not to say that there is no influences and no interconnections, but I focused on these imperial cultures that, 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 that have maybe the most profound and most lasting impact, including on the high culture. <clears throat> Hey, thank you very much. Uh, by the way, if you would like to ask uh, directly a question that you uh, post to the chat, you are welcome. So, uh, Pan Kirill, uh, if you if you would like to ask your question uh, directly, please. Yes, sure. Uh, good afternoon, Professor Plohi, and thank you very much for your report. And I have a question. In your opinion, what can help us now, Ukrainians? Uh, to build successful state, considering that we are now at war with Russia. Thank you. Yeah. Well, thanks uh, again. Um, I, I'm sure that uh, depending on the field of the speaker, whether it's someone uh, dealing with economics or military, the, the, the answer would be would differ, would be different. I am a historian, so I, I will I will ask, answer that question from the uh, uh, historical perspective. And um, for me, the, the, the biggest challenge that Ukraine has uh, today is the challenge of really uh, learning and finding the way of how to live in our own state. For centuries, the states that were running Ukraine were foreign. The, the part of the Ukrainian historical DNA is actually we are extremely good rebels. We are in opposition. We are in revolt. Uh, but um, the, 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 the way of learning to live in a state together and using the advantages that come with the state and not reject it and consider it as our own, as a continuation of us, is, is the absolute necessity in, for, for survival of the state, of the nation in, the, in this new world. And uh, that's, that's what Ukrainians uh, started to learn in 2013, 2014. There is a major shift, major change, but most of the, of the learning process is still ahead. Very good. Thank you. Uh, Ishik Hojam, uh, would you like to ask your question that you post here? Sorry. I yeah, I guess it's unmuted, right? Right? Okay, you can hear me. Um, thank you very much, uh, Professor Plohi. It was a great, um, interesting, really interesting um, discussion. And I think it's, I, I agree with Yulia that it is not really, I mean, this is Eurasia talk. So I guess sometimes PowerPoints are making it really more um, 
you know, we were more involved, I think, at least I was, uh, even though I don't know much about uh, Ukrainian history writing. My question was uh, something, I have two, one related to diaspora, Ukrainian diaspora and their contribution to um, Ukrainian history writing. And this was, uh, Actually, I think this was my a paper that I wrote for a for my policy political science class at Indiana University when I was having my PhD, um, and um, it was I think Harry Hale, um, and um, this was on nation building in Ukraine and how diaspora through their contribution in writing history when those at home wasn't able to, because that was the Soviet period, how they contributed. I kind of remember uh, the main argument of my paper. I don't know. I mean, I was just a graduate student at the time, but I would be really happy if you could say more about it. And the second one is about the, maybe I'll ask the second one later. It's about the similarities with Kazakh, because I'm more focused on Kazakhstan and um, uh, Ukraine and Kazakhstan have a lot of similar similarities in many respects, like the, um, in a way, Golodomor or, you know, at least the, the Kazakhstan's, uh, you know, history writing also have more focus on that or, you know, the same Soviet period and relations with Russia as the big neighbor and Russification, et cetera. So I know that they're also very much involved in uh, history writing in the post-Soviet period. And this state building, we have had our state before the Kazakh Hanate focus uh, was a very much uh, debated issue because at the time of, I think the uh, Russian president put in, commented on how Kazakhstan was never a state before Nazarbayev. So that kind of angered people. And I wonder, I think th these are like uh, similar dynamics maybe in Ukraine too, right? I mean. Um... Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Well, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for both questions. Uh, first on diaspora. Uh, you, so you started it and maybe you saw certain things that I didn't see living as part of it. So it's, it's different perspectives, but. Yeah. Uh, it's the importance of, of diaspora in general in Ukrainian um, 20th century history is extremely important because we see a mass exodus of people, mostly from Western Ukraine, the so-called labor immigration. So millions of people living uh, starting the end of the 19th century. And then there is a political immigration after the Second World War, which mobilized the immigration that was there before, before that, and the, the life continued. Now, um, the, um, unlike other, other um, immigrations, it was not just numerous, it was well organized. And it was all organized around the idea that, again, we have to continue here, as you said, because what is happening under the Soviet control. It's a destruction of our culture, of our history. So we have to maintain what, 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 what we had. So there was a mission, a mission that let's say, not less numerous Polish historiography or Polish immigration didn't have because they had at least their own state and Ukrainians didn't have. So uh, uh, that's, that's one issue. Another thing was that the um, with the second uh, political immigration, a lot of intellectuals came, and intellectuals became the leaders of that of that uh, community, mostly of blue collar workers, people not having big money, and those intellectuals said that the most important thing is actually to develop scholarship. So this very poor community funds three chairs at Harvard, right? So we exist, that's, that's the signal. We exist and we exist at the most important institute. They, they create through political influences the, the institute that funds by the local government in, in Canada. <clears throat> and in doing that, they're doing something really very important because there are diaspora organizations, academic and other organizations, which are basically working in the tradition of the old country 
But once you get to Harvard, once you get to University of Alberta, once you get to other places, what that means, you integrate your knowledge into a global knowledge. And that kind of a push that normally diasporas that are very conservative, which are very protective, normally don't do. And uh, in that sense, again, uh, certainly you, Ukrainians are, are in much better position in terms of uh, talking about their country abroad than let's say Kazakh, right? So we are now at the, at the um, here at Harvard, at the Davis Center for uh, Russian and Eurasian Studies, trying to develop a Central Asian program. And again, Kazakhs are there. We have a wonderful professor from Kazakhstan who is trying to organize this program. But again, that's the beginning where there is a Ukrainian Institute already exists in the 60s or 70s, right? Which again, it's institutional, but it's, it's, it's broader. So uh, the, the, the role is important. And then I, I talked about, about the, the uh, importance of the book of Subtelny, which was translated into Ukrainian and became a Bible for the entire generation for the 1990s of how you look at history. Um, again, with, with modest success of my book in Ukraine, again, it wouldn't be there if I wouldn't be, if the position would not be at Harvard, right? So that, 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 that influence continues. Uh, and uh, yeah, th thanks for asking this question. It is an important factor that, again, I, I know how important uh, Turkish diaspora is for, for Turkey, again, maybe in different ways. But, uh, but, but, but again, it's, 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 a big, it's a big and important issue. Uh, yeah, but by the way, we, we, colleague of mine, Jamal Kafidar, of course, does a great job promoting, promoting Turkish history at Harvard. Now, uh, uh, in terms of Kazakhstan, yes, there are, there are similarities. Um, and uh, again, the, the, the Kazakh famine and, and the, the Ukrainian famine, that's, that's the, the happening around the same time uh, in different ways, but these are the result of the policies of the center. You can talk about it imperial or not imperial, but it's, it's the policies of the center. It's not the policies that were designed, designed in those, in those places and in those localities. And I know that uh, there is a lot of similarity from my Kazakh colleagues, especially in the last in the last few years, in terms of what is happening in the post-Soviet space. So we, we are kind of in the same in the same boat in, in, in many ways. Uh, there are there are a little bit different challenges that we face. Um, and again, the, the big issue for for cultural self determination of Ukrainians is the really closeness historically and otherwise culturally to Russians. The language barriers are actually almost non-existent, at least for people like me who grew up in the, in the mixed uh, Russian-Ukrainian environment. It was at school that I learned that this language belongs to Ukrainian, uh, th this word belongs to Ukrainian and this word belongs to Russian. Um, so the, the, you, you don't have that in Kazakhstan, right? But in, in Kazakhstan, you have a different, uh, at least, uh, until recently, at, uh, at the moment of 1991, that that particular group was a minority in, in, in the state that was created in 1991. So there are similar cha challenges and there are, there are differences as well. And I know that when it comes to the, to the historians, including historians in Ukraine, but also abroad, the cooperation with Kazakhs is probably one of the most, uh, most um, uh, well, it is present and it is developing. Uh, if there would be no COVID, I was invited to, to Kazakhstan to speak at Nazarbayev University. So that there are a number of our graduate students who, who came from Kazakhstan, returned to Kazakhstan. So, and uh, there the, 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 the is really easy talking to them because there the, 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 the is some common background which goes beyond language and culture. We have so many questions actually uh, left and Sevilla uh, Hanim, if you can uh, if you can read your question or I can do it uh, in my own uh, as you wish. Okay, Sevilla. Um, okay, so I will because it's very interesting actually the question about the Soviet past. 
Um, thank you very, very much for the seminar. How Ukraine and Ukrainian people were depicted or reflected during Soviet era in cultural sphere like cinema, theater, or the literature. Can we talk about the exact uh, characterization of the Ukrainians? It's a very good question because uh, a lot of uh, Turkish scholars and uh, students, they watch uh, old Soviet movies, they fan of old Soviet movies. And actually it, it would be good to see your perspective on this issue. Thank you. <clears throat> well, uh, on a certain level, Ukrainians were uh, privileged in the Soviet Union in comparison to other non-Russian groups. And uh, the reason for that was that Ukraine has been the second largest in terms of the population uh, republic. Uh, uh, many products of the Ukrainian party machine were in, in uh, Moscow in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. And <clears throat> Ukraine had certain things that other republics didn't have. So one of them was the only, there were only two journals in the magazines in the Soviet Union that published translated literature. So one, as it was supposed to be, was in, in Moscow, another was in Kiev and was doing that in Ukraine. Ukrainian, uh, there were uh, two, two film studios and uh, Kiev and Odessa. So I don't know whether there were any in Kazakhstan or not. Maybe there were, but again, th th there, was, there was that infrastructure <clears throat> that wasn't in other republics. But uh, all of that actually put in together doesn't mean that the Ukrainians were <clears throat> even represented on the on the normal level in the in the Soviet cinema, which was completely dominated by Moscow uh, and Leningrad. And uh, there are episodic appearances of Ukrainians in the in the uh, movies that were not produced, let's say, in Kiev at the Dzhenko studio. And um, uh, but how do you recognize a Ukrainian, right, in, in, in the Soviet world? Because all of them, they speak Russian. So uh, that normally would be a person who speaks a surzhik, a mixture of Russian and Ukrainian, which immediately would point to the lower social status and origins. A person coming from the village to the, to the higher city culture, um, uh, there, there will be no, uh, there will be no uh, kind of a vicious portrayal of that person. There would be nothing, nothing uh, particularly uh, offensive on purpose. So it, it, those will not be villains. They would be sometimes people with humor and and, and good-hearted, or, or maybe a little bit sneaky. But again, that was a stereotype that was produced produced by that uh, the, 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 that me films produced at the center. Uh, in uh, films produced in Ukraine, there is, there is a different trend, and one of the best known films probably is The Shadows of the Forgotten uh, Forest Astros, Tini Zabutich Pretki. And it's, uh, it's, it's the, 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 you go into a, different, into a different direction. It's really a folklorization of Ukraine. It's about dances, it's about a particular way how they're dressed and so on and so forth which is another, maybe another extreme. So uh, I'm not an expert on that. I never, I never uh, really even um, supervised any, any, any student work on that because that's how we professors learn what is happening out there by, by, <laughs> by helping students to figure that out. So uh, please don't take, take this, uh, my comments as, a, as a, uh, basically as, as, as a verdict of any kind. But that is my impression as a viewer and as, as a person who lived during the Soviet times, who was attentive to, to things Ukrainian and that the, 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 these are my impressions. But again, this is a great topic to research and I will be more than happy to read a paper that would say that I'm completely wrong. And it was a very different story. That's, that's what the scholarship is about. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, the next question we have about Ottoman Empire from uh, Katerina Shafak. Uh, Pani Katerina, can you uh, can you write? Uh, okay, can you read your question? Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you for this opportunity to talk about so many questions because today we travel from one part of the world 
to another yes and uh, as we live in turkey so for me personally it's very interesting to discuss a question about uh, ottoman empire and ukraine especially uh, your perception what do you think uh, and uh, how do you understand this question especially impact of the ottoman empire uh, on the history of ukraine was it positive or negative and what about modern uh, historical books uh, how do scientists uh, uh, write about this question and this mm -hmm. event because uh, ukraine was occupied by ottoman empire for a while so that's interesting thank you uh, thank you uh, again uh, there is there is a trend the, uh, at least there is a number of scholars that come from that school created by omelan pritsak and they already mentioned victor ostapchuk and there is there has been a cooperation collaboration in, in the uh, in the um, uh, 60s and 30s uh, uh, again in Alchik is is a cult figure in, in, in those circles uh, there is a polish scholar Kolodzejczyk who published sources uh, on on the uh, on on the uh, ottoman presence in ukraine so uh, th there is research but it it, it only starts Generally, there is a um, push away from the Soviet tradition of portrayal of the Ottomans and the Crimean Tatars as absolutely negative forces. So there was a key document, a party document, the thesis is on the 300 year anniversary of the uh, reunification of Ukraine and Russia. And of course, the Ottomans the, the, were portrayed as absolute evil. Uh, the political context was also correct because, again, Turkey was part of NATO. So that, that page is being turned. So there is no negative or, or predominantly negative attitude toward that as existed during the Soviet times. Uh, but there is very little done in terms of the, of the research. And one of the, one of the problems, there are two problems the way how I understand it. First is, 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 is languages, and languages, it's not just modern Turkish, right? It's, it's written Ottoman text, it's, it's a completely different thing. One of my students from Dnipropetrovsk, Marina Kravets, again, mastered that. She's now, she's now in Toronto working with Maria Subtelna, the wife of, wife of Oris Subtelna, the author of the history that I talk. She specializes in, in, in Turkish. So it looks like that more figures are really abroad working on that, at least in, on the Ukrainian side than it is in Ukraine when it comes to history. So the, the negative pages turned, but what to write on the new page is still very much an open question. So for mm -hmm. I, I certainly encourage people to, to, to look into that. That's, that's a, big, a big lacuna. So languages and training is one problem. Another problem, and uh, I, I will be happy if my, if my Turkish colleagues Correct me, but I, I remember hearing from, from my friends about the, the basically not very happy state of the Turkish archives, especially when it comes to the Ottoman history in terms of, again, how they're structured, how easy or not easy access is to. So the, the, the sources and then the ability to, to read and interpret those sources are big, big challenges. But again, I, I under, my understanding is that that, that, that negativity, that, that hostility, it exists, but it maybe exists as a continuation of the Soviet narrative. But generally, the pages turn. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and we have uh, the next question, actually not one question, but many questions from uh, Turgut Kerem. Uh, so, Mr. Turgut, can you, uh, Turgut Hoja, can you uh, read your question? Because he's currently the very much. Yeah, specialist. I on Ukrainian history, and he wrote a chapter about Ukrainian history, historiography, let's say. So please. No, no, I'm, I'm not a specialist. That, that's too, too, too much uh, for me, but uh, I'm, I'm very much interested in Ukrainian history. I'm a good reader of Ukrainian history, and I'm very glad that you are now uh, today speaking to us. It's a great chance for us to listen to you. So my questions are about methodology of history writing, Ukrainian history writing, Ukrainian historiography. Uh, my first question is that uh, you said you tried to frame the Ukrainian history within the framework of cultural frontiers or borderlands paradigm in your uh, book, uh, Gates of Europe. Uh, 
And my question is that, may such an approach uh, undermine the agency of the Ukrainian people or the political actors and turn the entire Ukrainian history into an object that is shaped by other agents? Uh, how do you reconcile the problem of agents with uh, studying Ukrainian history from within the cultural frontiers framework? This is the first question. The second question, actually, uh, recently, post-colonial paradigm is uh, gaining popularity among the historians of Ukraine. And what are your views about this paradigm, post-colonial uh, post paradigm, the weaknesses, the strengths, and so on and so forth? And the third question is that, Actually, it's also about methodology. Uh, presently, Ukraine had been under the rule of different empires for centuries. And because of that, actually, in my point of view, there's not one Ukrainian history, but there are multiple histories, right? For example, the history of left bank Ukraine is completely different from the Galician, Galicia, history of Galicia. So my question is that with what methodological tools can we write a holistic Ukrainian history? Or is it possible? Or even is it desirable to write a holistic Ukrainian history? Thank you very much. Thanks. It's, uh, the, the, all, all of them are excellent questions and, and go to the, to the really core of, of uh, thinking about Ukrainian history and what I was trying to do. So I'll, I'll start with the, with the first one, the question of the frontier. And by using this approach, whether you actually marginalize the history of, of these groups and people in Ukraine even further than it has been marginalized within the empire. And uh, my, my answer is uh, basically the, there is a risk of doing that, absolutely. But uh, for me, I was looking at the, at the uh, creation of a new quality on this borderland. Because again, the, the borderland has at least two sides to it, or maybe three. And when different cultures come together, they create something new and interesting. And in case of Ukraine, I had actually a, a very, very good material to show that this is indeed the case. That this is not just our construct, and it's not just a new trend, and we are trying to push our material to, to fit the trend. And one example I am, I am given is the history of, and creation of the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church, which is a symbiosis, the church between East and West. So that's where the two, the two worlds, the, the two frontiers came together and they didn't just clash and didn't marginalize their groups. They created something new, which is uh, again, the, the church, which is under the jurisdiction of Rome, but has the, the Orthodox tradition. And there is a continuing kind of a competition between East and West in that, in, in that church. But it creates a new, a, new, a new quality, a new identity. And that's, that is the product of the borderland. That's the product of the frontier. Another product of the frontier of a different one are the Cossacks, right? So the Cossacks is a new social group that came as a result of the, of the um, as the result of the, um, this in, encounter between settled population and, and nomadic population. That's where the Ottoman history and, and other things come, come together with the, with the Ukrainian history. Again, it's not just clash. It's not just the burned earth that comes out of it. There was a lot of burning and a lot of clashes and a lot of killing. But there is also a new social structure and the social structures become new centers. So. Cossacks, Ukrainian Cossacks create their own state, which is unheard of. There are many Cossacks, but it's only the Ukrainian ones who, who create that, create their literature, their culture. It's a product of borderland. You look at the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church and what during the interwar period Metropolitan Shevtetsky is doing. That becomes the only national institution in the land. He is supporting arts, he is supporting education, creating theological academy and so on and so forth. And this is coming out of the institution that is born out of this. So the, the, the peripheries come together and create new centers and create new, new, new identity. And that's what I was trying to put emphasis on. But you are right, again, it's, it, it very much depends on, on, on where you put emphasis and there is that, that threat. Uh, colonial. 
I uh, think actually it's, 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 a, it's, it's a productive, productive area of study. Given, uh, given that, uh, again, as, as I said, and th th there is no, no news to anybody that most of the states that exist today came out of, of some form of colonial existence. So the, 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 the countries like Turkey or, or Russia or France are uh, exceptions with, with long imperial traditions if you look at the, at the membership in the United Nations today. So, what colonial perspective gives to me is actually it's a possibility to think comparatively about Ukraine and, and any other part of the world. And where I found in my own research that perspective very useful is when it comes to the culture and, and the, the functioning of the imperial language versus the local languages. So that 19th century, I, for me personally, the colonial perspective was, was very important. There is interesting work appearing now on the, on the internal colonies in, within Britain or in the Russian empire when it comes to the economic development. I'm not an expert in, in, in economic history, but where I see potential interest is, is in the way how, for example, the um, resources are extracted from Ukraine or from any other republic in the Soviet Union and where they're put. And it was only during the first two five-year plans that whatever was extracted from Ukraine was put back in terms of the building of the, of the um, industrial infrastructure. But otherwise there was, there was, uh, the, the, there was a, a, a form of colonial or semi-colonial exploitation. You look at the late Soviet period at the so-called cotton case and uh, at Uzbekistan and this monoculture, one monoculture economy. It just cries out there that it's, 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 it's an imperial context which is happening in the Soviet Union. So again, I, I am against actually pushing all this uh, trendy theories because today they are trendy and tomorrow they are not. And your text is still there and you, you will be really embarrassed about, about, about pushing that too, too far, far. So you have to be really careful. But uh, all, this, all these approaches encourage you to think comparatively. And, and, and put your, your own story in, in or your, your own question into a broader context. And now multiple histories. That goes to the, to, the, to the question with which I started my presentation saying, okay, whether it's a legitimate exercise at the whole, right? Right in national, national history. And my answer is, yes, it is legitimate on the basis that there is a group of people who uh, want to know how in the world it happened that they came together. What combines them? What are differences between them? They deserve history. And the history that is there, the one that I suggest is a new national history. Now, you mentioned that there is an Austria-Hungarian empire and there is Ottoman empire, and, and we were discussing about that. And absolutely, you can write about histories of this empire. So different parts of Ukraine integrated into, plugged in into different narratives and different histories. But, and that will maybe will do much more justice to the people of 17th century than the prison that we have today. But again, we are there and our salaries are paid by people who are still around. <laughs> We want to tell them and answer the questions that they're interested in and answer in, in the way that would make academically and scholarly, scholarly um, uh, um, legitimate. Now, how I dealt with that? Uh, I guess my, my uh, survey is the first survey in which I treat the uh, Galician history of the 19th century and East Ukrainian history of the 19th century in the one section. And uh, the way to do that is comparative. If political scientists can take Brazil and can, can take Taiwan and compare it, what is so wrong with taking Kharkiv in Eastern Ukraine and or Donbass in Eastern Ukraine and Drohobych oil fields in Galicia, which are happening at the same time, the process of industrialization, and look at them together and see what is in common and what, what the differences are. So um, that's, that, 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 that was my way dealing with that. But again, I was, I, 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 in the process, I was crossing the borders and the boundaries that 
existed there even in the most classic national narratives, still Galicia and, and, and Dnieper Ukraine would be treated separate, in separate categories. You look at book, book by Bob Maguchi, the same period in Galicia and the same period in Donbass, there would be 200 pages between them. So, so even, even structurally, they, they, they just belong to different worlds. That, that, that's continuation of that tradition and recognition that there are differences. But what, what, uh, what uh, reader in today's Lviv and uh, hopefully one day in Donbass will want to know is actually what is, what is there to unite and, uh, and what makes them different and separate. And that's, that's, that's the task of, the, of the, that kind of history writing. Thanks again for your questions. And thank you for your answer. Uh, we have uh, a few similar questions, of course, about Cossacks, because without Cossacks, the history of Ukraine probably is so impossible to imagine. Uh, just, just like for my students who just like first year student or freshmen, uh, we, we are not talking about Cossacks that like from Kazakhstan is uh, another group of uh, from the medieval history of Ukraine. So just to be clear, just so we, <laughs> we didn't mix up. And we have two questions about Cossacks at least uh, for now. Uh, it's Berat Tildis asks, my question is on the Kub uh, Kubain Cossacks. They were frontiers on the Russian Empire against local uh, Caucasian people at the 19th century. Uh, then at the beginning years uh, of the Soviet Empire, we see some revival of Ukrainian culture and language among them. Uh, so is it Ukrainian, Ukrainization, he asks. And um, then uh, today um, they seem to uh, symbolize Russian imperialist mentality. So I just want to learn your relation of Kuban Cossacks Ukrainian identity in the past and present. So this is uh, first question about the uh, Kuban Cossacks and their relations with Ukrainian Cossacks. And the second one from uh, Bedrihan um, Ziyanak. Um, I want to ask um, about historiography. We, historiography. we know that the Cossacks, so Kozaki, played so important role in Russian history since uh, uh, 16th century, um, especially Ermak Mazepa, uh, which um, images and stereotypes are there in Ukrainian historiography about the history of uh, the Russians and Ottomans of the 18th, 17th century. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, first of all, about, about the Kubain, uh, Kubain uh, Cossacks. So um, we are dealing here with the um, history of the, of the settlement of the imperial borderlands. Uh, where the, uh, once the uh, Russian Empire um, wins this number of wars against, uh, against the Ottoman Empire in the late 19th century, what is happening is actually the, the Russian Empire goes to the Crimea, annexation of the Crimea, 1783, establishing its four posts on the, on the Black Sea. So the Geopolitical frontier is closed, and what starts is actually the, 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 the settlement of that region by different groups of population, including Germans, Mennonites, refugees from the Ottoman Empire, mostly Orthodox, like, like Bulgarians and, 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 and Moldovans. And what that means is that the empire doesn't need any more this military class of the Cossacks that is partially involved in agriculture, partially is involved in, in um, uh, warfare. So the, the, the frontier is closed. There is no place for frontiersmen, right? Think again about the, the American, American Westerns. You don't need all those cowboys running around with, with their pistols. So what the empire does, it actually takes the Zaporozhian Cossacks and moves them to the new frontier where the, the, the war, where the competition for the frontier is still going on, which is Kubai. So the Ukrainian Cossacks become one of the, one of the first settlers there. Later there is, because it's, closely, it's closer to Russia in terms of the way how you get to the area, an influx of, of Russian peasants come in. 
And you create this, this mixed, mixed region where the first settlers are Ukrainian, speaking Ukrainian, singing Ukrainian songs, and the empire falls apart in 1917. So they're trying to attach their territory to Ukraine. There is a mixed results with that. Eventually they end up to be part of the, of the Russian Federation. But the Soviet Union is a new empire tries to culturally accommodate minorities. So what is allowed is allowed the Ukrainian language, education, Ukrainian publications, and so on and so forth. The uh, teachers uh, training institute in Ukrainian in Kuban. All of that come to an end in the middle of the famine of Holodomor. Because the, 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 the regime treats the Ukrainian famine as basically more than just a resistance of peasantry. It is closely connected to Ukrainian language and culture. So all, all uh, cultural institutions, educational institutions for Ukrainians outside of Ukraine. And Ukrainians were the largest uh, non-Russian minority in the Russian Federation at that time. All of that is closed down. The Ukrainians become, become uh, uh, Russians overnight. And uh, by 1991, there are some elements, again, the folklore, the singing, the language, that is there about, about our Ukrainian roots. It's early 90s. Uh, but uh, by, by now, again, the, the, the Russian state really employs the Kuban Cossacks like it employs Don, uh, Don Cossacks and so on and so forth as a, as a really carriers of this old imperial, old imperial um, uh, traditions. So this is, this is a story of really, um, um, uh, imperial uh, and cultural um, uh, integration and acculturation of the of a particular group. So again, um, the, 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 they are, they are integrated at, at, at this point into the into the Russian language, culture, Russian structures. Again, history is maybe different, like in some other regions of Russia, like Starodub. Uh, but uh, it looks like that the 20th century actually turned the page on Ukrainian part of that history, or, or Ukrainian part of the history of that region. Uh, and uh, now the, the stereotypes, again, the worst in terms of the old, old tradition, of course, were the, the uh, uh, Turks. And uh, the Russians, it depended on, on how, how, um, how uh, Ukraine oriented the stereotype is again in the old tradition in the in the 19th century in Taras Shevchenko, the term for Russian is Moskal. Uh, it's from Moscow, but Moskal that is the term also used for a soldier. So that tells you that the way how the local population was encountering the empire, it was through the army, the army that was stationed there. And there is a lot of a lot of a lot of jokes and and uh, songs and other things about uh, saying to the Ukrainian girls that actually the worst thing you can do is to marry a Moscow. So again, whether it's about Russia and Russian or it's about the the the, the, the getting involved with the soldier in the army who will be sent tomorrow to a different place somewhere else and you get stuck with your child, that's 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 a big question. But again, uh, the, 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 the stereotypes are there. Um, and in, in that sense, again, I would say that maybe uh, in terms of the negativity, Moscow is certainly above uh, someone who would, be, who would be a Turk. Turk would be also in terms of stereotypes, um, category of, of uh, uh, the, the term would be applied for someone who doesn't understand something, which means basically the language barrier. So in Russian, the same, the same, uh, the, the Germany is term, uh, German is term Niemitz. Niemitz means dumb. So someone who can't talk, someone who can't speak. So Turk uh, would function in, in Ukrainian folklore and Ukrainian tradition more in that term than, than, than in that. 
Um, thank you very much for a great remarks. And by the way, about the term Moskali, um, Alexander, Professor Alexander Sirida has his um, oven theories that it actually comes from um, Turkish, Moskovali. So when they were uh, like shouting Moskovali, it became uh, Moskali. So this actually word comes from Turkish language into our language, which is uh, very um, funny as I, I think. Oh, very interesting, yeah, very interesting. Th theory, and uh, um, we actually, the next question, we have um, two main questions left, and the next question will be connected to, to what you um, said just lately, about, especially about the Ukrainians just one day um, wake up uh, as a Russian in uh, the historiography, uh, historiography at least. So uh, Olga Budnik, she is a, a reporter, she is a a journalist of Ukraine Forum based in Ankara in Turkey. She asks, um, Mr. Professor, during the Soviet Union, it was impossible to know the truth about the history of Ukraine and Ukrainians. We are now opening more and more pages, often the terrible truths about the destruction of our nation. Um, attempts to rewrite history and hide the truth from Moscow are still ongoing. What do you think are the best way uh, to counter such attempts? Um, and she continues, at present, uh, a very important issue on uh, is Russia's attempt to claim the victory in the Second World War. Um, it is interesting to know your attitude to such attempts and whether they can be effective. What is the attitude to this issue in the West? And um, she continues, very long question. Um, you spoke, so first was about the uh, attempt to rewrite the history, second about uh, the claim victory on the Second World War, and the third one, you spoke about the um, ex uh, expediency of talking about the history of Ukraine and the history of multi-nation state. Uh, undoubtedly, this is um, a very balanced approach, but can't such an approach lead to a separatist tendencies? We are already seen some such things, particularly with some uh, national minorities in the West and in the East. Um, can the multinationality stand in the way of unity? And how can this be prevented at the different levels and stages? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. It's it's really a rich, rich question. So I'll, I'll uh, try to answer to maybe two key key parts of that question. And one would be about the the um, uh, World War Two uh, two competing narratives, and the second one about the multi uh, multi um, ethnic history of, of Ukraine. Um, <clears throat> Uh, with the uh, with the uh, history of World War II, that became a real battleground, not only in historiography, that became a major battleground during the uh, current crisis and current war in Donbass, with the uh, signifier of the Russian or pro-Russian forces would be the St. George's, uh, uh, St. George's Strip, which comes, at least in, in the Russian mythology, goes back to the to the myth and mythology of the victory in the great in in the world war ii in the great patriotic war which is as it is known in russia and um, again uh, that's 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 that that's an important and important uh, subject today what is happening in terms of uh, historiography in ukraine and in my understanding is it, it goes to the to the broader public as a whole the uh, Ukrainian experience during the Second World War is treated in the context of the of the world history and European history in particular. Um, the uh, Ukrainian war didn't start uh, with the uh, Hitler's attack on the Soviet Union in June 1941. It started much earlier with the partitioning of Czechoslovakia, where the, there was a short-lived uh, the, so, the Ukrainian Republic in, in 1939. It continued with the German attack on Poland. So chronologically, the, 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 the Ukrainian World War II and the Russian World, World War II don't match. And there are also differences in the way how uh, Ukrainian and Russian historians approach that subject. It's not about victory. It's about actually uh, the, the, the experience and the suffering of the war. It's also about heroism 
of, of ordinary soldiers and it's about the, the, the victims. So it fits much more the, the narrative that uh, exists in today's most of the European countries in terms of their memory about World War II than what Russia proposes. And in that sense, it's not just a Russian-Ukrainian conflict of memories or different, different historical narratives. It's, it's a broader one where Russia really is, is on its own. Again, it's, it's a dominant uh, force in, 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 in the region, but <clears throat> in terms of its understanding and interpretation of, of history, it's, it's uh, isolated in that sense. And again, certainly Ukraine rejects that, that interpretation. Uh, <clears throat> in terms of multi-ethnic uh, multi, um, history, well, um, as, as I told you, the uh, history by, uh, by uh, Robert, uh, Paul Robert Magachi is considered in that way. It's, it's much richer. It's, it's a bigger history than that, but it's, it's considered that way. Uh, I decided to move beyond national versus multicultural paradigm. Look at, at, the, at the country and the region that combines, combines all these groups and talk about the culture more than just language. So, uh, because uh, the, the, the criticism of multi-ethnic multi, uh, history is of the same kind as the criticism of the national narratives, except that now you apply the same the teleological approach to each of the smaller groups. So you multiply the same, the same approach, but actually you split it between different groups. So methodologically, it's not particularly something new. You just have a, more players that you, you, you treat with the, same, with the same instruments that you have. So uh, I'm, I'm looking at the, at the Ukraine as a product of this, of this um, uh, movement of the frontiers, different processes in which come together not only different ethnic groups, but also the, the movement of the borders of the imperial borders creates different regions. And there are differences between regions as well. And the question, okay, if you pay too much attention to the regions, if you pay too much attention to the minorities, does that produce potentially the, the, the grounds for separatism or not? Well, the answer is the way how you deal with that because you can't deny an ethnic group or a region a certain type of identity on the same way how it was denied, let's say, to Ukrainians in, in the Russian Empire or during the good, good parts of, of the Soviet history. So the, the trick is really to integrate those histories into, into the, the, the history of the majority, which are Ukrainians, not by er er eradicating it, but by finding the structures, finding the paradigms, finding the frames in which this, 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 uh, the, the, these groups or these regions can feel themselves welcome. And that's, that's uh, frankly one, one of the, one of the uh, tasks that I, I uh, faced and uh, again, I was trying to deal with. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we have a few questions, um, so I, I, still questions are coming, I'm very sorry, so maybe we can try to, to make it, uh, I don't know, shorter, I know that usually questions are huge, um, so Xenia Gökmen uh, is asking a question, would like the Xenia by herself do this? Uh, okay, okay, oh, great. Uh, professor, thank you very much for your seminar. I have a question regarding nation identity. Uh, since uh, the western and eastern parts of present Ukraine during the history were influenced by different cultures, may we say that there is a lack in a single Ukrainian identity now? Thank you very much. Well, uh, thank you. Uh, well, what, what we uh, have certainly a profound difference, uh, I would say that uh, you, you can divide Ukraine in different ways in different regions. But I would, for, for the purposes of this answer, I will talk about three different regions. But the one would be, let's start with the West, and that would be the part of the former Austria-Hungary. The, the empire in which the electoral democracy started already in the mid 19th century. It didn't come to the Russian empire until the, the beginning of the 20th century and was a short lived one. So what that meant was that the, the, the national identity, the schools, the systems, the institutions had there this head start in terms of self-organization. 
So the, the, the political environment was different and what you get, you produce a different kind of national identity. Uh, then we cross the border with the, with the Russian empire and we get to the Russian empire, which then again would be divided into two groups. One group would be Eastern and Southern Ukraine, which becomes, uh, becomes settled already under the Russian control, under the Russian rule, which means Russian imperial administration, but later also means when the industrial development of the region starts an influx of ethnic Russians comes to the region. So that's, that's another, another group, another, another category. Ukrainians are the majority, but again, in the, in the cities, there are the, mm, mm, uh, little space for the functioning of the Ukrainian language, or Ukrainian culture, and so on and so forth. And then there is the, the central Ukraine, which is, um, which is um, mostly in terms of the cultural dominance, economic dominance was controlled by the Polish nobility and wasn't part, was settled before the Russian empire, wasn't part of the huge industrial development. And it has its own, its, its own tradition and its own, its own logic to, 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 to their development. So Ukraine of 1991 came into existence as an independent state as a political nation with different languages and with different histories of the regions. And Ukraine in 2014 survived as a political nation. Because if you look even at, at the number of people and where people come from who died in, in, this, uh, uh, in, in, the, in the battles of 2014 of Ilovaisk, of the Baltsov and so on and so forth, it's basically, it's, it's uh, many of them come from the Russian speaking areas and languages. So, that is different from the model of Ukraine of 1917, when it was based on the peasant culture, on, 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 on language and so on and so forth. So that's how Ukraine emerged in 91. That's how it survived in 2013, 2014. But there is also a realization that our richness in languages and in cultures and in regional histories and so on and so forth can be used against us. And in the last maybe two, three, four years, there is a much bigger push toward the uh, actually increasing the cultural component in the political structure of Ukrainian nation with language, with the, with the Svetovishivanki, with uh, people switching uh, to, to, to Ukrainian language for, 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 for cultural, political and other regions, reasons. So Ukraine continues functioning as a multilingual and multicultural state. But certainly after, after the events of 2015, there is much more emphasis on, uh, on the, on the um, cultural and linguistic component. And uh, it, it, they don't come necessarily from the government. The current government actually took a neutral position on that because they're not, they're not promoting anything in particular, but there is this, this demand coming from the society. So we are in transition. Thank you very much. Actually, we have very similar uh, to this question. And by in part of this, you actually answer it. It's from R.C. Shakila Putri. Regarding multi-ethnicity, does Ukraine government use a pluralistic approach in a reconceptualization history of Ukraine? What makes this transnational approach important for, uh, to, to use in multi-ethnic contexts? Yes, sure, thank you. Well. Uh... Ukraine is, is, is a very, um, in a very particular linguistic and cultural situation. Um, the, the push toward the European Union and the, the signing of the association agreement uh, and, and other attempts to adjust legislation brought also to, to Ukraine the, the um, uh, European, uh, European legislation on minorities good in languages and so on and so forth. Uh, and before the events of 2013, 2014, that was something that certainly the, the uh, party of regions and, and, and the previous, the, the, the um, members of the parliaments that were considered to be pro-Russian, whether they were or not, but they were considered to be pro-Russian, they were pushing that. Now, the problem in Ukraine is that, especially in the big cities, the so-called minority languages like Russian is the majority language that doesn't allow really much space for the existence of, of Ukrainian one. 
And what that means is that the, the particular legislation and models that exist in the European Union can be used as this for, form of a model of an inspiration, but it just can't, apply, can't be applied in the, in the Ukrainian context because under the protection of minorities, you really support the majority and actually uh, hurt the minority in, in that case. So that, that, that means that there is no easy solutions for Ukraine. There is no just something that can be taken and, and implemented. Something that can be taken can be used only as an inspiration. And then it's, it's what, what is good about Ukraine is that uh, no government actually can get its way in imposing what, what they want on the Ukrainian society. It's a process, it's a process of negotiation, renegotiation. There is a trend and we know where the trend is going. But how it is done, the best way to look at that is maybe to look at the stock market. There are ups and downs, ups and downs, and then you try to find where is the trend line that, that goes through it? What is the tendency? What is the, 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 the dominant trend is? So that's, that's, it seems to me, also what is happening with, uh, with Ukraine's um, thinking about its own identity in terms of cultural identity. But uh, it, its political identity went through, through really a trial in 2013, 2014. It was very difficult to imagine that uh, there will be people who will be uh, uh, prepared to pay with their lives for the, for the, for the state, for, for the nation, for, for their identity. And those people were there and they're still there. And, and this is, this is again, uh, a new, new phenomenon that you are prepared to, to support that state, not just by voting in referendum for Ukrainian independence, but actually by risking your life. So it's a new, it's a new quality. And not, not new quality in the world or for other countries. It's, 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 it's something that is very obvious. Uh, but for Ukraine and for many of new countries that came out of, of, the, uh, out of the disintegration of the empires, this is this is an important stage. Okay. Thank you. And yeah, I promise the last one uh, <laughs> because we, we already have uh, much time. Um, okay. Uh, it's a question from Felis Tutku Aydin. Felis Hojam, uh, would you like to uh, ask a question? Uh, yes. Hello, Professor. Thank you very Hello. much for this great talk. Uh, I really enjoyed it and learned so much from it. I'm also an observer of. Ottoman uh, Ukrainian history writing, uh, but I'm not an expert. Uh, I wanted to ask about uh, a question uh, about the place of Crimean Tatars in the modern Ukrainian uh, history writing. As you know, there is, uh, I say, historically unwitnessed closeness of both nations. I think we are observing history in the making right now. And I'm predicting actually uh, Crimean Tatars, maybe, uh, I don't know, some decades from now uh, will be considered a part of perhaps Ukrainian nation. And uh, I was wondering uh, how can we deal, I, I'm also of course a Crimean Tatar from Turkey. So I have other hybrid identities. I have a Turkish identity, uh, and the Crimean Tatar identity, but I just learned that I can be considered a part of Ukrainian diaspora and I can get this identity card <laughs> so that I, I can also join uh, in the Ukrainian nation, which I also celebrate. Uh, so I was wondering, uh, I wanted to ask about a particular difficulty uh, that can come into play in our further rapprochement as two nations. That is the, uh, you know, certain difficulties in history, perhaps relating to slavery, right? How can we, uh, as historians of um, crime in Tatars and Ukrainians, approach this issue in a constructive uh, way? What could be the, you know, perhaps direction or uh, guidance you can provide us in that mm -hmm. respect? Thank you. Oh, oh, thank you. Thank you. And it's, it's a very important question. I, I, I wanted to talk about uh, Crimea and somehow it didn't happen. So your question gives me an opportunity to do that. Um, well, the, 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 
Crimean uh, Tatars were probably the most vilified group in the Soviet historical narrative, right? If you, if you take the group and, and resettle and don't want these people to come, the, the legitimation comes from history, they, they, they were so awful. And uh, that's, that, that was the dramatic the sh shift and change that happened uh, with, first with Perestroika and then 1991, the emergence of independent Ukraine. And uh, I was, um, we were writing a book on the history of the Cossacks in Dnipropetrovsk in 1990. I was one of co-authors. And uh, that was the first time maybe we can, we, we, uh, again, it didn't come from me. It came from, from a, my colleague who was actually a military officer in the Red Army and then became a historian, was really pushing this theme of cooperation between the Crimean Tatars and the Cossacks, of course, in the war against Moscow and Russia. And it got there. That, that was one of the first cases where the, the Crimean Tatars are getting, are getting positive treatment as opposed to, 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 to negative one. And um, that's, that's basically the, the, the trend that continues. So there is um, one person who keeps talking uh, about, about um, uh, importance of, of slavery in, in Ukrainian history which the society as a whole and the rest of the community are not actually prepared to take that, to, to suggest that you come from a nation that was, was in, in which slavery and, and you were on the receiving negative end. So psychologically, it seems to me the Ukrainian academic community and the society are not prepared to do that. So Alexander Halenko writes about that again. He is very positively disposed toward Crimean Tatars and Turkey and so on and so forth. But he, he, he tries to introduce this topic of slavery and everyone says, okay, it's not us. We are not prepared to deal with that. And what is, what is there is again, uh, talking about, about uh, the, the battle of Konotop where the, the, the Crimean, Crimean Tatars and, and the Cossacks are defeating the Moscovite army. So these elements are, are being, uh, um, being, being uh, stressed. So I would say that negative approach is behind us. How, it, how the positive one is created is actually by focusing on selective parts of the history that would work for us politically today. But the real complex assessment of that is, is, is still ahead. And again, I, I think that the, 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 main, the, main, the main responsibility here in starting this very civilized, very difficult, but civilized debate is on us, the, the, the academics. And then it will get to the journalists and then it will get to the, to the, to the broader public. But again, the sooner we start that, the, the, the better, because if uh, there is a lot of minds in, in that field of, of the, of the Ukrainian-Crimean Tatars relations, which we don't want to, to explode. And you have to deal with that carefully. So again, the trend is positive, but I, I don't see yet the, the, the really complex and, and, and balanced approach and look at, 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 at the entire history. Again, the, my, my predecessor here, uh, um, Omelan Pritsak, was one of the first who was actually pushing that, who, who was talking about that. And, and that, that, that trend is there. It's also interesting, it came from diaspora, right? There were questions about diaspora. Yeah. So the, the question is how, how to continue is that? Yeah, yeah. But the, the further you push away, right? It can explode psychologically. Exactly, exactly. We, we can't- It's we, we like can't all afford. traumas, I think, yeah. We can't afford that kind of uh, just ignoring the parts that we don't like. Yeah. You know? We have to deal with them in, in responsible way. And again, it's, it's, it, it, for us historians, it's very clear what was going on. There are particular economic models, there are particular societal models, and, and, the, the, and they're there. And again, it's, it's from Ukrainian side, it also overcome the, the importance, key importance of the Cossack mythology for us, or reformulate it, right? Because Cossacks, it's not just heroes and this is also a settled colonialism, right? So it's not just the, the, the Crimean Tatars who are doing slavery, it's also the, 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 the Cossacks who are moving and taking this territory from there. So it's, it's a complex picture and, and I don't think we started, started dealing with that. Thank you, thank you, great answer, thank you.
Okay, so uh, I guess uh, we have more than two hours already, so we will finish. So, Professor, uh, thank you really very much for this great presentation and for these comprehensive answers uh, to the a lot of questions. And there are some questions that we couldn't uh, deal with uh, still in the chat, so I'm very sorry. I hope that uh, next time when you visit Turkey, uh, maybe I hope th this will be not just virtual, but also the real one. We are waiting uh, for you in Ankara, in Karabulki, in any city uh, of Turkey, and you are welcome. And I hope that um, after your this uh, seminar, the um, Ukrainian, um, the interest uh, to Ukraine among uh, Turkish researchers and the young scholars will uh, be more and more. And uh, thanks to your book, they will have a source uh, for the information and for the research. So thank you very much for, for coming. Well, thanks a lot. Thanks for this invitation. It was a real pleasure. And I certainly look forward to my not virtual but real visit to Turkey. Yeah. And I want to say that uh, people in the audience, especially young people, whether you come from Turkey, from Ukraine, from any other region, as you could see, this is a new frontier. There is very few old guys who dominate the field. You can really do whatever you want with this field. The, 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 the prospects are, are great. So I, I wish all of you success because again, you're doing something really very, very important in terms of history, but also in terms of relations between the two countries. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. You're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you. See you Thank in you. the next. Thanks. Yeah, Thanks we're, we're going to have, yeah, we'll announce the next um, seminar, um, next talk in our seminar series very soon, hopefully. Okay. Uh, you'll all join. And yes, uh, Professor Ploy, you'll be uh, more than welcome to, if you yeah, have thank time. You. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Good. Now that I have faces behind emails, it's, it's, it, it's great. It's a different reality. So. <laughs> I know. I know. Uh, bye. Thanks for thanks everyone for joining us, and I think it was great. I mean, um, so it was a great intellectual uh, environment that motivated all of us. Now I have to go and cook and take care of my sister. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> that was nice. Thanks, thanks for organizing, for helping to organize this. Yes, thanks. Thanks. Bye. -bye. I'm ending the meeting, and uh, see you next. Okay. Again, goodbye.